The Skeptic Zone Live would like to thank Think Inc. and the publishers Alan and Unwin for the prizes we give away during this episode. Cub Reporter Maynard here for The Skeptic Zone right now. In universal time, it's about 27 past Wahoo and, and the tension in the new venue for the Skeptics in the Pub is building. It's the Occidental Hotel, not far from Winyard Station, not far from the Menzies, and not far from Sanity. It's going to be a night where anything can happen, and it probably will, but mainly after we leave. But, you know, stuff will go on. We're expecting our Dr. Brad Mackay to turn up. I'll be talking to him about his pants. Uh, we're all set up here. We've uh, gone to no expense with the setup. I know you can't see this, but imagine a palatial, expensive broadcasting board with cameras everywhere. Well, we've got nothing like that. We've got uh, uh, two uh, plug-in candles that we basically talk at, and that somehow they're in, it's like EVP, uh, el- electronic voice phenomenon. And that's how we basically record our show. We're hoping that inanimate objects that don't have any electronics in them will somehow record the sounds that we make, and later we can go along and just listen to the table and somehow get that onto the podcast. So we, if you excuse the uh, quality of the show, it's, it's because we use the best tables we can, but sometimes they're just not as good as microphones. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone Live! That's right, live from Skeptics in the Pub, just above where all the nautical people are having something pretty interesting going on downstairs. Here are your hosts, Richard Saunders and Stefan Zoika. Oh my goodness, it's electric in here. It is. Hello, it's Stefan. It's almost ectoplasmic. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's wonderful to be here. I'm a part time, I used to host all the time, but I. I'm living another life now. You are living another life. Yeah. Stefan and I started the Skeptic Zone podcast way back in 2008, but before then, before then, sorry, microphone, we were doing all sorts of other things. We were doing other podcasts and an, even an online video series. Yes, and we, what, what did it used to be called back then? The, 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 what did it used to be called back then? The, the, the tank. The Skeptic Tank. The Skeptic Tank. tank. Yeah, it was disgusting. Yes. It, was, it was disgusting. <laughs> well, we've, we've cleaned up our act a lot since then. Oh, um, it's not going to get any better, folks. I'm sorry. It's not going to get any better. But no, great to see everybody coming along here to the new, the new the Occidental new, Hotel. The Occidental. It's wonderful. The, what, the staircase the up here was just a magnificent. And do we like the room, everybody? Yeah. Yay. It's like living in L. It's the, oh. sorry, sorry. I, I told you I'm only a part-time host. I said it didn't get any better than that. So what? What episode is it? Four sixteen. Four si- oh, yes, that's numerologically fantastic. <laughs> it's a numerology, is it? No, Four six- it's not. Okay, no. it's not. Um, now, a big shout-out to our uh, Skeptic Zone reporters who can't be here tonight. Our voiceover man, Jim Wilshire. Dr. Rachie, of course, one of the founding members of the Skeptic Zone, who's in uh, Wyoming yeah, at the moment. lots of posts on Facebook about that. That's a lot of posts. Joe Alabaster, who does wonderful reports, can't be here. And Heidi Robinson, sadly, can't be here tonight. Uh, they're with us in spirit, I'm sure. <laughs> I told you there's a lot of ectoplasm. There's a lot of ectoplasm. And uh, I, I must say, right off the top, a big thank you to Signa Dean, who's here tonight, who will be doing a guest editorial for us. So, Signa, thank you for coming along. It's Head wonderful. up, Signa, where are you? Where? Hey! Hiding over there in the corner. I'm on a couch. Come She's on a couch. <laughs> couch sir. This place has got couches. Oh, it's amazing. It's, it truly is amazing. A couple of shout-outs. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice around the room we've got some signs for an upcoming Think Inc. event. We've got Susie and Dash. Hello, Susie and Dash from Think Inc. Hi. Hey. The people who brought you James Randi, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Ben Goldacre just recently, and lots more things coming up. More of them Think Inc. soon. Ooh. A shout out to an old uh, friend of mine who is uh, quite an interesting man, a sort of a world traveler. William Broom over there in the corner. Hi, William. Is an international reporter. Lovely to see you again. Just back from North Korea. Wow. Ooh. Can you, again, just back, just back. <laughs> From North Korea. Ooh. I'm sure he's got a tale to tell, <laughs> to tell about alive. that. He's, he's still alive. Just. Just. That's good to see. Anyway, coming up on this week's show, we've got reports from Aran Sagev, the welcome return of a grain of salt. Yay! Yay. 
And we've got Maynard interviewing Dr. Brad Mackay. Where's Dr. Brad? Where's he's gone? Oh, there he's at the back. Hi, Dr. Brad. Coming up. He's hiding. Uh, we've got some uh, reports from some of our reporters who have sent through uh, audio files, and we'll be playing those. A bit later on, and Dr. Stefan. Oh, is that right? We've got a, doc, a special Dr. Stefan report to round off the show. Well, let's hope so, because this is so live, I'm actually in the middle of writing the script for it. So, so by the time, we, by the time my, my thing comes up, it'll be ready. Now, those people have got tickets, yes? Everybody got a ticket? Yep. Hang on to those. In a couple of segments... Not you. <laughs> in a couple of segments' time, we'll be giving away um, some prizes. In fact, there's prizes all evening, so look out for that. But I think that's all we have to do at the moment. Before we get on with the show. Yeah, it's yeah, time yeah. for us to run over to the bar, I think. Oh, I think we should. I think we need to settle down. Because right? there's this, this hypertense around here. It is Very hypertense. hypertense. But we're going to chill, we're going to relax, we're going to get on with the show. Oh, by the way, oh. Maynard is embedded in the audience tonight. Oh. I'm over here at the bar already. Oh. I'll just be here dispensing medical advice, even though, as I mentioned earlier, I never went to uni. But has that ever stopped anybody dispensing <laughs> medical advice? <laughs> you know how they embed, they embed reporters when they go to Iran and Iraq. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smoke <laughs> vitamin C. I see. <laughs> All right, well, let's get on with it, shall we? While we do that, we hope you enjoy The Skeptic's Own Live. Grain of salt. Grain of salt. Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Seged. Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome in particular to any anti-vaxxers in the room. Um, in late 2015, Judy Weileman was awarded a PhD from the University of Wollongong. Weileman is a well-known and highly active anti-vaxxer, and it was therefore not a surprise that her thesis, titled A Critical Analysis of the Australian Government's Rationale for its Vaccination Policy, concluded that the government policy of promoting vaccines is flawed. Most listeners to this podcast already know the sad story of how a university shoots itself in the foot, while at the same time helping one of its students harm public health. So I will only recap it in broad terms. The PhD... Weileman, her supervisor, Dr. Brian Martin, and the University of Wollongong were, un- were heavily criticized for this. Starting in January 2016, a series of articles appeared in various media outlets exposing the folly of awarding a PhD in the University Faculty of Law, Humanity, and the Arts on, the, on a matter with a strong scientific element without ensuring that the science is covered appropriately. In this case, not only was the science uh, content insufficiently examined, But the thesis is full of lies, misrepresentations, cherry-picking, claims without evidence, and conspiratorial thinking. Critiques and criticisms of the PhD have come from a range of organizations and individuals well-placed to assess the claims made by Wileyman. This included an article published in the journal Vaccine, which was co-written by University of Wollongong's Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health, researcher and toxicologist Professor Alison Jones. The article assessed the need to balance academic freedom with the potential for harm to the public health. Additionally, more than 60 University of Wollongong academics, mostly in sciences, signed a letter in support of vaccinations written by Professor Heather Yitman. And the letter still appears on the university's website to this day. Wileyman has gone on to continue with her anti-vaccine activities, now armed with a PhD that has the word vaccination in the title, a dangerous combination. She has also unsuccessfully sought compensation from the university over investigations that the university conducted uh, around her conduct, uh, both for, uh, during, especially during her master's degree, actually. And then, recently, something snapped in her brain, and a series of bizarre communications started, which are the topic of this segment. On September 19th... <laughs> On September 19th, an email was sent to Professor Professor Alison Jones and 86 other University of Wollongong academics, many of which signed Eatman's letter. Thankfully, some of the recipients were not exactly thrilled to be on the receiving end of this email from uh, Jody Weileman, and and we therefore had access to this email and uh, and also to ones that I will describe in in the rest of this segment within minutes of them arriving. Uh, but Judy Wileyman also puts uh, most of these emails on her website, so they're pu- publicly available. Uh, 
The subject of the first email was open letter, or the first email that we saw was open letter three to Alison Jones, correction to UOW Academics comments on UOW website. As you can see, let me show you. It's a long email, okay? So printed on the podcast, you can't see, but I'm actually waving two full pages, two full A4 pages. Um, and just remember that um, there was also a list of recipients, with, you know, 86 recipients, so that was another page and a half. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, long, a long email. Let me, um, let me read you some gems from, from this email. Quote, Dear Professor Alison Jones, as I await your response to my previous email of 16th September, I would like to address the comment about immun comments about immunization that have been promoted by the University of Wollongong on its website. I note that you have signed your name with 60 other academics to the personal opinion made by Heather Yitman in her professional capacity. I'm not exactly sure what it means to have a personal opinion in a professional capacity, but anyway... However, it is necessary to point out that Heather Yitman's expertise is in nutrition as president of the Public Health Association of Australia and not immunization. And she has made misleading and unsupported statements about immunization in her comments. End quote. Clearly, Weilerman thinks that her PhD in uh, humanities makes her more qualified to comment on vaccines than Professor Heather Yitman, president of the Public Health Association of Australia, as she herself said. Weilerman then criticizes at some length six specific claims made in the letter, including that immunization protects children and saves lives. She actually critiques that. And that it is one of the highest impact and most cost-effective public health interventions. And she concludes with the following, quote, The concerned global community would like you to respond to this evidence to ensure that UOW academics are not endangering population health by promoting the personal opinions of academics who have not studied immunization policies. Please could you ensure that personal opinions of UOW academics are removed from the UOW website if you cannot respond to this evidence, end quote. Note the tone, first of all, but also you will, you will have noted that she, posts, she specifically focused on immunization policies, and the reason is that she sure as hell has nothing at all to say about the science of immunization. She has no, no knowledge of that at all. But if you think this is bad, just wait. On the 23rd of September, four days later, an email was sent to a shorter list of recipients, but this time including Minister for Social Services, Christian Porter, Minister for Health, Susan Lay, Human Rights Commission President, Julian Triggs, I don't know either, um, uh, Victorian Health Minister, Jill Hennessy, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Tanya Plibersek, and others. Also an open letter, letter entitled Financial Incentives for Medical Interventions in Healthy People. It criticizes the no jab, no pay policy. It states that, quote, this government policy is mandating, mandating the injection of aluminium, aluminium hydroxide, aluminium phosphate, borax, thimerosal, formaldehyde, gelatin, phenol, monosodium glutamate, um, uh, phenoxyethanol, egg protein, yeast, antibiotics, and she now lists like six or seven different antibiotics, um, and more in every infant from day one of life, end quote. She goes on to recommend the anti-vax movie, Vaxed, by former Dr. Andrew Wakefield, as not anti-vaccine, and links to several articles and videos showing anti-vaccine activists in action. She then links to a video which she claims shows that parents' questions were not answered at a public seminar at the Telethon Institute in Perth. What really happened was this. So, so the amount of aluminium contained in vaccines is smaller than the amount produced in common food. The other thing, the other thing that is often questioned this is, a waste of time. is things such as formaldehyde. So formaldehyde is a compound that is naturally produced in the body, and the amount oh, of really? formaldehyde that's circulating in a child's immune system is actually many times greater than what's included in that. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have trouble getting other where, people... Where are the long-term studies? So my suggestion is that we... Um, look in the camera. Where are the long-term studies, guys? Look at, look at the camera. Us. 
Where are um, the long-term the studies? You can hear bit, me. So we're happy for you to Where are the long-term studies? And, um, ask those questions. Where are they? And um, we're very happy as the Institute to, to try and bring evidence out there, to try and bring our expertise out We're not there. going away, so, people. Um, if you're able to hear me, can I ask you please to put your hands together for our panel members? Yeah, so the woman shouting in the background was Judy Weilerman. If you couldn't really figure out what's going on, it's because a raucous murder of anti-vaxxers, that's a correct um, collective, <laughs> collective noun, isn't it? A murder of anti-vaxxers. Um, shouted the researchers down to the point that the seminar had to be abandoned. This was a seminar for young parents, and it had to be abandoned because the anti-vaxxers basically took over. Wileyman finishes her email by demanding again that Alison Jones provide evidence for her claims of the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. Three more days passed, and on the 26th of September, a similar list of recipients. By the way, I have all these emails printed here, if anybody has a lot of time. Um, a, a similar list of recipients to the previous mail, but also this time including the Premier of New South Wales received another open letter by email. The subject of the, film, of the uh, um, email was film censorship and financial incentives for medical interventions for healthy people in Australia. The opening of the letter is telling. Quote, Thank you for getting involved in the vaccination debate by signing your names to Heather Yitman's um, comments on the UOW website. The Australian public expects that if UOW academics are supporting and promoting government immunization policies, then you are able to provide the supportive evidence for the claims that you are signing your name to. End quote. She then, she then goes on to copy a, a letter sent from an anonymous correspondent to Mike Baird, the Premier of New South Wales. The letter protests the, con the con controversy uh, in Victoria around the movie Vaxxed. Uh, those of you who don't know, it was pulled and then put back on, then eventually pulled from a, from a festival and uses such eminent sources as the website of the Daily Mail. But the author also gives credit where credit is due, and I'll read that. Uh, quote, Unfortunately, there is a lobby group here in Australia that, that orchestrates negative mis misinformation campaigns with regards to people questioning the different aspects of vaccination. This group is called Australian Skeptics. <laughs> she spelt it with a C. This, <laughs> this group have some representatives from the medical industry and some well-placed journalists in mainstream media that collude with grassroots members of the Australian skeptics. Their letter-writing campaigns and media articles are formulated to appear to government and, and politicians that there is a groundswell of public opinion relative to a particular topic. But their numbers are small, and in fact, it is a manufactured illusion of public majority uh, so, uh, so as to sick, scare politicians into doing their bidding. They carry out the, this operation very professionally. Thank you. Um, and it worked with the No Jab, No Play campaign. Whew. We were doing very well. This is the same group of people who orchestrated the campaign to try and make universities stop teaching complementary, complementary medicine courses. Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> if Vaxxed is scheduled to screen in New South Wales, I expect that the Australian Skeptics Operation will target the New South Wales government and Mr. Baird also, end quote. To which I say, damn right we will. <laughs> Two more days have passed. And on the 20th of September, another one. This time, 101 recipients, essentially everyone who was on any of the previous emails. Um, they received another open letter. It's addressed to Social Services Minister Christian Porter and refers to financial incentives for medical interventions in healthy people, a breach of the Nuremberg Code. <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Porter was thrilled with the update provided by, Ms., uh, by uh, Wileyman. Quote, I'm writing to inform you that as of the 28th of September 2016, the response I have received from the University of Wollongong Professor Alison Jones and Heather Eatman by the way, every time she mentions Alison Jones, she writes toxicologist. And then Heather Eatman, she writes nutrition. And so it's like we, we need to know that they're not in vaccines. It's very important. So um, the response I've received is silence. 
Dr. Justin Yerbury has responded that the university scientific community supports with gusto the government's social services policy, but he has not provided any evidence for this position. Darren Saunders, Un University of New South Wales, echoes this, this opinion, and Dr. Maria Mackay, Associate Professor Heath Aykroyd, Aykroyd and Dr. Warren Rich have asked to be removed from this email debate, but as of the 20th of September, they have not removed their names from the UOW website and, they are sub and where they are supporting unsubstantiated opinion as immun on immunization, end quote. Clearly, Judy doesn't get the point of these responses and mostly sil silence because she ends her email with the following, quote, I state again that, that if UOW academics would like to be removed from this email debate without Alison Jones uh, or Heather Yitman providing evidence for their claims, I direct you to remove your names from the UOW website where you're providing your opinion and not evidence-based medicine that the government's immunization policies are safe, effective, and necessary, end quote. Amusingly, she signs this email with kind regards. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad she didn't say lots of love or something. <laughs> Seven hours later. That's a thick one. That's like four pages or something. Seven hours later, but after the clock has already ticked into the 29th of September, another email. She's a bit like Donald Trump, in the, you know, busy, busy in the middle of the night. This time, it's not an open letter, but inter internal matter within the University of, New so of uh, Wollongong, where she complains that her formal academic complaint regarding harassment and defamation while studying at the University of Wollongong was not handled properly. Curiously, she copies 81 people on this email, including all of the signatories to Professor Eatman's letter. Just interesting. Among, uh, among her complaints, quote, UOW published Heather Yitman's nutrition uh, views on vaccination on the UOW website one week after my in-depth thesis on Australia's vaccination policies was published on the UOW website. This enabled my PhD thesis to be disparaged by Alison Jones on the Australian Skeptics uh, Inc. lobby group website. It was then disparaged further by the SAVN and Friends of Science lobby group and in the Australian newspaper. End quote. A day later, 30th of September, another one, another open letter to Minister Porter, copied the world and its dog. The letter contains the usual falsehood, but the reason it's interesting is that we are starting to see Judy really crack. This is how the letter starts. Quote, directives. Silence or no response to these directives is an admission that your policy is invalid. One, I direct you to provide me with a legitimate public health reason for making the full schedule of vaccines, 16 plus, mandatory for social welfare benefits in 2016. Two, I direct Alison Jones, toxicologist and executive dean of the UOW Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health, to provide her professional opinion that, the co that combining the listed ingredients in the schedule of 16 plus vaccines mandated in this policy in newborn infants slash children slash adults is safe and health promoting in a genetically diverse population, end quote. She actually says directives, and if you think that's not enough, this entire section is in bold in the email. So she's getting very shouty and very angry. She ends by saying, quote, silence or no response is an admission that this policy is invalid, and you and those who are supporting this policy will be liable for any ill health or death that arises from this policy, policy in the population, end quote. And then, quote, I await your response to the directives I have outlined above, and I will take silence as no or no response as an admission that there is no valid reason for this social services, no jab, no pay policy, and those that are supporting it will be liable for any harm that is caused in the Australian population, end quote. One day later. <laughs> A short one this time. Uh, it's the 1st of October. We are a few days, a few days ago. Email number seven. This time it's to Professor Alison Jones and copying 103 academics and um, politicians and media outlets. It includes a copy of the previous day's email with the directives and starts with the following. Quote, Yesterday I copied you into the email that I sent to the Minister for Social Services, the Honorable Christian Porter MP. I'm forwarding my letter to you directly to ensure that I receive a reply from you. <laughs> Good luck with that. Government ministers and public health authorities involved in the, with immunization policy are obliged to provide information to the public under the Public Service Act. 
I'm therefore directing you and the Minister for Social Services to answer the two directives listed below that are critical to the implementation of coercive and mandatory immunization policies in social welfare policies and also in many employment situations, end quote. All this could be quite amusing when it's just one somewhat unhinged person with an unjustified PhD sending long emails. But that's not where it ends. A few hours after Judy's email number seven, an unknown number of people received an email from one Jennifer um, Haywood. Jennifer clearly knows how to use BCC, an art Judy Wileman is yet to master, so we don't know how the full list of recipients, but it's extensive because we actually received it within minutes from multi multiple sources, so it's, it's, it's been out there. It's probably the same list of uh, recipients. The author states that, quote, Australian universities used to be places where controversial issues were openly debated. University students led protests against government decisions during the Vietnam War. Debate was encouraged, not suppressed by university authorities, end quote. And goes on to, quote, respectfully ask that you remove the post from, on your website as a sign of good faith and arrange the appropriate debate with Dr. Wileyman so this issue can be debated reasonably and to the credit of the University of Wollongong, end quote. She signs off as Jennifer Haywood, investigative researcher, Canberra. I was really interested to know what kind of researcher she is, so I looked her up. And on Facebook, under education, self-described investigative researcher, Jennifer Haywood, has one entry, Rockhampton Girls Grammar School. So this is clearly not over. Anti-vax campaigners will continue to harass academics and politicians with these emails. While it is safe to say that none of the email recipients take any of these claims seriously, this affair clearly demonstrates how incompetent the decision to award a PhD to Julia Wallerman was. Everyone involved on our side of the argument said at the time that she would use this to increase her reach and impact, and unfortunately, we were not wrong. Let this be a lesson to other universities. Academic freedom does not trump quality of scholarship, and it definitely doesn't trump public health. You ignore those principles at your peril. I have a quick comment to make regarding my talk to ensure there is no misunderstanding. While I was happy to take credit for various activities on behalf of Australian skeptics, it should be noted that I was, at least to some extent, being sarcastic. Mostly, it's because two groups in particular, Stop the AVN and Friends of Science in Medicine, have been at least as active, and in many cases, more. While we work closely together, it is a constant failing of anti-vaxxers that they think everybody who's against them is a spawn of Satan, I, I mean spawn of Australian skeptics. And I didn't mean to imply that they're right, because they're not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aran Sagev. It was so nice to have a grain of salt back on the Skeptic Zone. Folks, over the, the eight years of the Skeptic Zone, of course, we've had reporters, many reporters come and go, and that's fine. People often give their time uh, quite freely, except for Maynard. He insists on being fed from time to time. Uh, we've had a lot of different reporters, and uh, it's really nice that Iran is uh, back this time with his grain of salt. Now, our next segment on the show is actually a pre-record from our reporter Cassandra Perryman. Dr. Cassandra Perryman, let me just get my notes. As I said, this will all be edited out in the final version, so it'll sound really great. So this is uh, the CAS Files report with Dr. Cassandra, and she's going to be talking about hypnosis. So since it is a pre-record, you don't have to give your full attention to the front of the room, obviously. Uh, it should come out over the speakers, but it might be also a good time to slip over to the bar and get Maynard a drink. I'm going to sound downstairs with the sailors. I see. All right. So here's the report, and after that we'll have our first prize. So this is Dr. Cassandra's report about hypnosis. Cass Files with Dr. Cassandra Perryman. Hello, Skeptic Zone Live. This is Dr. Cassandra Perryman, and I'm going to discuss hypnosis in this episode of The Cass Files. Anyone new in my life that I'm a psychologist, there's a good 50-50 chance they'll bring up Freud and hypnosis. Although I'm not fond of that topic, it is still marginally better than the old, does that mean you can read my mind? Yes, that joke is old, folks. 
Well, and that explains why I tell people I'm a psychometrician. There's just no comeback for that. But anyhow, back to Freud and hypnosis. First, Freud is a sidestep off of psychology. He's taught in basic introduction classes as part of our history, but he's not a psychologist per se. Freud instead founded the field of psychotherapy. Granted, our two fields join together for academic conventions and work together in private practice, but a psychologist is technically not a psychotherapist and vice versa. But really, I digress. What does Freud, though, have to do with hypnosis? Well, Freud was, for at least part of his career, heavily involved in hypnosis and believed that psychoanalysis is the heir of hypnosis, which was actually founded in around 1770 by Franz Mesmer. In 1916, Freud even wrote, quote, We do not forget how much encouragement and theoretical clarification we owe to it, meaning the field of hypnosis. Hypnosis is used by psychotherapists and even some psychologists. In that instance, the person usually has a master's or PhD in therapy, and they choose to use hypnotherapy as one of their tools. If the person is a hypnotherapist, though, well, that's a different game. You see, hypnotherapy is a completely unregulated industry in both Australia and in the U.S., They have their own licensing body and their own system of providing accreditation to programs, the same programs that a lot of clinical and psychotherapist practitioners take. No post-secondary degree is actually required to enter the programs. According to the American Association of Professional Hypnotherapists, quote, in the United States, hypnotherapy is an unregulated profession. Some would say it's a self-regulated profession, meaning you do not require a license to offer, provide, and charge for hypnotherapy services. For the skeptical movement, that's a serious red flag. But in this case, and in the right clinical practice, that red is a bit more of a pink. You see, hypnosis has been shown to be somewhat effective, at least, for pain management and potentially fatigue and anxiety. But the evidence just isn't there for smoking cessation or even weight loss. Funny enough, though, those are the two most advertised purposes of hypnosis. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that repressed memories and past lives are not a thing, and there are no rampant satanic cults roaming the U.S. countryside, no matter what a bunch of hypnotherapists in the 80s and 90s said. So, though, what is hypnosis? According to the good old Oxford English Dictionary, hypnosis is, quote, the induction of a state of consciousness in which a person apparently loses the power of voluntary action and is highly responsive to suggestion or direction, end quote. By pure definition, hypnosis is at least partially possible. Individuals in high states of duress or fatigue are easily suggestible, and some have even said that their actions were involuntary. Remember back to the story of Patty Hearst, the idea of Stockholm Syndrome, or the myriad of false police confessions elicited through manipulation and fatigue? It happens, and those experiences at least partially match the definition of hypnosis. The person is under extraordinary duress. They apparently lose their own power of will and voluntary action, and then they are highly responsive to the suggestion or direction given to them by an outsider. The problem, though, is two specific aspects of the definition. First is this altered state of consciousness, and second is the loss of voluntary action. Thus far, hypnotherapists have failed to provide scientific evidence that either actually happen. We don't even really have a definition for altered state of consciousness, and loss of voluntary action is a very easy cop-out when you do something you shouldn't have. If we change the definition, though, to exclude those two problematic aspects, we have a phenomenon that research has already shown exists. This would make hypnotherapy kind of a mental placebo, and that there was little to no difference between actually being hypnotized or just pretending or thinking you were hypnotized. It is a very interesting concept. In the end, though, If hypnosis actually induced the defined state of consciousness and the individual lost voluntary control of their actions, is it even ethical? Is forcing an individual to take direction involuntary ethical at all? Wouldn't it be better then to change the definition to match an already known phenomenon and openly embrace the mental placebo? I suppose that's a philosophical debate for the field of hypnotherapy and not one for the psychologist. was The Curse Files, and thank you to Dr. Cassandra Perryman over in the United States who sent that uh, through for us to enjoy tonight. 
from the Skeptics Zone Live. Now we come to the first prize giveaway of the evening, and what a wonderful prize it is. The Memory Code, autographed by Dr. Lynn Kelly. This is the book making major uh, waves around the world in its uh, investigation into how ancient cultures remembered things, how they kept their family traditions going. Uh, it's a fascinating book, and the bookmark is a, uh, an Australian skeptic's card autographed by James Randi. Oh. So, yeah, he had to get a mention, James. Now, I'd li- I've got, you've got all your tickets, yes? So, Maynard, would you like to step forward? Hey, it's good to see James Randi getting a boo. It's about time to on you, sir. Good on you. There he is. How's the crowd going, by the way? All right, one guy booing, but I like that. It's always good. You've got to have at least one. Okay. So, tickets ready. Maynard, do the honours, please. And the winning number is... Hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Hang on. Look, uh, <laughs> now, any magician in the room will go, he's just going to replace that with a friend of his. I don't have that many friends, OK? <laughs> OK. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, I've got my glasses on for this one. The non-prescription ones, too. Uh, let me see. Side. Oh, <laughs> much easier to read when you take... It's a blue ticket! Oh. Everybody's got a blue ticket. <laughs> oh, I can't, look, I can't believe I could... It's A1. Zero one. A01. A01. We have a winner. There we go. The, the, the man in the blue suit. <laughs> there you are, sir. Um, I, I think this is a book that uh, rabbis look up to see what's going to happen in the future. There you are. The memory code. Enjoy it. I feeling that was going to happen. You must be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you may not. Then you are a lucky winner. Yeah, he's, so, he's so excited. His shirt has become untucked. That's excitement. That's excitement. <laughs> now, we have uh, more prizes to give away in the second half of the show, but to round off the first half of the show, and there'll be a 10-minute break where you can... What, what, they can run to the bar? Well, I believe the thing to say is to go to the bar and say, sailors and minimum spend. Use that in the same sentence. <laughs> works, works downstairs. <laughs> I like to... Thank you, Maynard. And I'd like to uh, introduce... You can go back and be embedded now into the crowd. If you like. Okay, but I'll be taking my chocolate coins with me. Who wants one? Uh, and now, thank you. Thank you, Maynard. I'd like to uh, introduce our guest reporter, our guest editorial reporter, Signa Dean, everybody. <laughs> now. Hi, I'm Signa Dean. I'm probably one of those well-placed journalists in The Skeptics. I'm a bit worried that they know about that. Um, Tonight, I'm not a journalist here. I'm just a member of the Skeptic Committee. Um, But my report is a little bit about some experiences I have had recently in the cross-section between skepticism and journalism. So the story... Oh, yeah. And because it's a bit of a radio play element, Richard will be helping me out a bit later on. Um, So the story here basically starts with my really amazing dentist, I'm talking about her because she's great. She's super professional. She's very good at fixing my teeth. And thanks to her diagnostic skills, I also discovered that the reason I have mystery headaches for like years and years is because I grind my teeth at night. Um, I also think my dentist is nice because she doesn't make fun of me. Um, I thought she would when I broke my tooth on a skittle and landed in her chair not long after... I had broken a different tooth on a piece of pork crackling, although I was eating a delicious Vietnamese salad, so that was kind of worth it. Um, So, of course, being a dentist, she does charge a lot of money, so I'm sure she doesn't entirely mind that my teeth are just so ridiculously bad. Um, But she has also told me that if I had been exposed to more fluoride in my childhood, chewing on hard foods wouldn't be so dramatic and scary as it, as it is to me these days. For example, just don't offer me pork crackling. Um, the thing is, I didn't grow up here in Australia. I grew up in Latvia. And in Latvia, water fluoridation is not really a thing, or at least it wasn't back when I was growing up there. And on top of that, I also failed the genetic lottery. So it just means that my teeth are just generally just brittle, the enamel's really weak. They're just not that great to begin with. Plus, no fluoride. Um, Now, over the past two years, I've broken a tooth four times in total, and I lost one of them. So they're really bad. And that's why I'm so grateful that my dentist doesn't make fun of me. Um, As you can imagine, slowly losing my teeth before I'm even 30, has been pretty stressful and pretty expensive. 
So that's why I really love the joke that anti-fluoridation activists are actually running a racket for dentists. <laughs> you probably heard the news last week that Mackay Council in Queensland voted to stop adding fluoride to its drinking supply. That decision was made with six votes against five, so it's not totally hopeless over there. Uh, but it was hopeless enough to make such an important public health decision fall in the wrong hands, basically. Uh, now, you, most of you probably know that Queensland has had a long, shoddy history with water fluoridation. Um, the state currently has 77 councils. Three of them have naturally occurring fluoride, so they don't need it. Uh, 24 do add fluoride to their water supply, and thankfully that does include the bigger ones, you know, Brisbane, Gold Coast. So... That's pretty good. But that still leaves us with 50 councils in Queensland that refuse to add this benef beneficial chemical to their water. The reason for that is basically because it's just not compulsory over there. So you'd think it's a paradise for dentists. However, if you read the media, you'll notice that dentists over there regularly are going to the media asking for mandatory fluoridation statewide. Like, they don't want this to be happening. Apparently, kids' dental health rates are pretty appalling in Queensland. Um, now, McKay's council decision is especially bizarre because just three weeks ago, we heard from the National Health and Medical Research Council, or NHMRC for short, uh, on this very same issue of water fluoridation. They, on the 14th of September, they released the latest draft paper on the health effects of water fluoridation. And here's the Research Council's take-home message from that paper, and I quote, The findings add to a long history of research that shows that water fluoridation helps to reduce tooth decay in children and adults. This current review shows that community water fluoridation within the current Australian range does not cause harm. So that's what the NHMRC is saying. Now, being a science reporter and a journalist, I used this news to write a quick article on it via science about why fluoridation is deemed safe. So basically an explainer of sorts that people can share on Facebook and read and maybe get a bit of a background on the issue. And here's a comment on Facebook that I received from that article. It is more than clear in the science I studied and peer-reviewed papers that this toxin must be removed from the water supply. So, according to the latest eligible literature review by NHMRC, adding fluoride to drinking water reduces tooth decay by 26 to 44% in children, teenagers and adults. You can get mild fluorosis, which is a thing people often complain about when they think about fluoride. It's, you get those white streaks on your teeth, uh, but that does not affect their function. And there are ways to avoid fluorosis before it happens. So basically, fluoride, harmless. But fear not, here's another comment on Facebook on that article on how fluoridation is perfectly safe. Fluoride is a neurotoxin. Do you even understand what that is? If you don't... Maybe that's the flu ride at work. <laughs> Again, according to the research council, who actually know how to evaluate evidence, water fluoridation has no association with IQ, or cancer, or Down syndrome, or mortality, or hip fractures, or bone cancers. That's all in that draft paper. It's listed there, um, starting with IQ, because fluoride... You know, according to that, previous commenters apparently making us all idiots. Uh, but what does the concerned public think about that? Here's another one. Why has fluoride in drinking water been banned across Europe? So it's a different person. <laughs> yeah, it's a different person each time. These are all different people, everyone. Uh, and also this person spelt it fluoride. It's a common so trend. Also. Again. Why has fluoride in drinking water been banned across Europe? Yeah, um, it hasn't. Let's move on. The Research Council points out in the draft paper that fluoridated drinking water is not considered a therapeutic good or a medicine by, the, by our own TGA. You bet there was a comment about that too. What drug ever is administered by putting it in the drinking water? Again, not a drug. How do you possibly control how much is consumed? Poor pharmacology, poor reporting, unfollowing you, SBS. Sorry to see them go. So even if medical researchers scrutinise all the available evidence and declare that there are no adverse health effects for Australians drinking fluoridated water, you will still get people who also say this. 
The fluoride added to our water supply is not the naturally occurring kind. It is the waste product often sourced from China. Outrage. Why didn't I uncover this in my, you know, highly difficult research writing this article? As with any good public health conspiracy, it's obvious we can't make people love fluoride by presenting them with more evidence. Especially when they seem to only read the headline on Facebook and start furiously typing in the comment box. So that's why my personal favorite comment under that article was this one. The people worried about fluoride poisoning are more likely to suffer from aluminium toxicity uh, from their tinfoil hats. (laughs) So can we cure tinfoil hat syndrome with science? Unfortunately, probably not. Thank you. Thank you, Signa. That was great. And I really appreciate Signa stepping forward to uh, give a, a guest editorial on the Skeptic Zone, and I hope she can do some more in the future. Now, folks, we have a 10 minute break. Attempt why we uh, just make sure the show's running along. Maynard, why don't they head to the bar and buy you a drink? I think that's what they should Minimum have. spend. That was my, we'll see you all my nickname in high school. <laughs> we'll see you all back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Right, now we were just taking the 10 minute break here so I thought I'd take a chance to come to a, a table that's pretty exciting here, there are a bunch of rowdy noisy people, one of them hasn't even got his shirts tucked in so you can tell what kind of night he's expecting just look out. Now, who have we got here, we've got Jeff, Colleen and Jenny and all oh, good to see you here for this live recording, what do you think of the new venue for the Skeptics in the Pub? Oh, Very good. Much better. More much room, not as crowded yeah. menu not too bad? Yeah, can see everything, yeah. can yeah. hear everything mm. yeah. No, no rowdy interlocutor, interlocutor. Yep. Yes. And I, I couldn't believe I, pull, I pulled A1 out of the bloody <laughs> raffle thing. Of all things, I thought we were going to get rigged or redraw, but no. Yeah, yeah, so you made sure you were at the front of the queue and the tickets are being handed out. Yeah, we, we got here early and we got 0 1 and 0 2, and I thought, yeah, fat chance. But being a skeptic, I know it's got just as much a chance as any other number. Good on you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll buy you a drink. Um, yes, I, I would love a, uh, a Diet Coke. Could be great. Uh, this gentleman's going to buy me a drink. A, a Diet Coke would be great, Johnny, so thank you. Why? What's your name, sir? Johnny. Oh, God bless you, Johnny. God bless you. Thank you. Wow. He's buying me a drink. Johnny getting me a drink there. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please cast your third eye towards the stage. Hopefully, enliven your other two eyes. We don't want to see any, uh, any cross eyed third eyes. Um, we are kicking off for the next segment of the Skeptic Zone. Episode number uh, 416. Yeah, that one. And to kick off this segment, we are going to talk to Maynard, who is going to talk to Brad Mac. Hi! Thank you, Chair Gentlemen. I'll, I'll play the theme music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just we can't do anything without the theme music. No. Here's Maynard's spooky action. At a distance. And we've got some spooky action for you too. In fact, this, in- this interview is so good, I've got two microphones. Yeah? It's, a, it's like a press conference. Where, where are the long-term studies? Where are the long-term studies? That was actually Brake and Morant's last words. Not many people know that. It was, it was not shoot straight, you bastards. It was, where are the long-term studies? Well, I have a doctor here. Uh, which university did you go to, sir? Uh, I didn't go to the University of Wollongong, so that's fine. Um... I'm just thinking, since I've never been to university, that's looking pretty good for getting a degree. Uh, Because, I mean, uh, you are a a well-known doctor, and uh, they have a a self-proclaimed researcher. I'm actually a self-proclaimed pharmacist. Yeah, and um, how was that working for you and your patients? Mainly on the weekends after about midnight, and uh, <laughs> all I can say is it's a small test group, but we're all very happy. <laughs> <laughs> because Brad is, of course, on embarrassing bodies, which is something I read on his Fet Life pro- uh, profile, and um, it's uh, and I thought you know that's kind of a pretty wild statement to be making, but uh, that, but it's a pretty wild show. I mean, you talk there are about no embarrassing bodies here. Oh, no, there's not. No, there's not. Look, you, you, you do... Richard stripping in the corner. Oh, <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from television, Dr Brad Mackay. <laughs> I read that on Wikipedia. Because <laughs> I would never go to any other website. 
that is a, a wealth of information. Uh, now, earlier, we're going to refer back to earlier in the show where we were having a bit of a chat about vaccination there, and it's mentioned that it's one of the great public health initiatives of our time. Um, is, that, is that your public stance on it? Do you ever let anyone... Do you ever sign a thing that says that they cannot have a vaccination when they ask for it in your office? Well, I think after modern-day plumbing, vaccination's really second to, to helping the civilization. Uh, I did have a patient who came in for the, the first time at the clinic um, wanting me to sign a form for, for his children to make them exempt from getting vaccinations. Uh, I'd never met them before. I'd never actually seen his children before. Um, but he wanted me to sign the form to say, yep, they don't need their jabs. Um, and so I asked what grounds he had to not vaccinate his children, wondering if they had a medical condition. And he said, no, it's, um, it's, a, it's just because I don't want to. I said, well, that's not considered to be relevant at the moment. Um, you still need to protect your children. Um, do you, like, is there any other reason? He goes, oh, it's because of religious views. So what, what religious views do you have? He's like, oh, my family's religious views. I'm like, well, what, what, <laughs> what religion does your family have? And, um, and he just did, like just jumped from the topic and said, you can't tell me that there aren't any Muslims out there that don't like vaccinate their children or are forced to do it. I'm like, well, okay, well, you're being racist um, and you're being religious. Um, but, but also, like, there is no um, reason in the Muslim religion to not vaccinate your children. It's really important to do that. Um, and so I... I decided that I wouldn't sign this form. Um, he got quite angry at me. Did he even say what religion he was? No, no. no I, was no hoping, I, I hope he was going to say Catholic and you'd say, well, can you just explain transubstantiation for me while you're at it? <laughs> and then I'll happily sign whatever you want. <laughs> no, so no, no religion whatsoever. So, um, yeah, so I, I said, well, um, I think that you're a danger to your children and, uh, and a danger to society, and so I don't think that I should be signing your forms, and I think you should be vaccinating your children. So, um, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to come back to see me at the clinic. But that's yeah, so, so the consultation went well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe not for his kids, but we'll see how we go. Wow, OK. <laughs> well, look, and, and are you doing another season of Embarrassing Bodies? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm being busy doing a whole lot of other things. So I'm on Channel 9 with the Today Show in the morning. Um, I've just been touring with Dr Ben Goldbecker, so that's been fun. Yes! With, uh, 15. I've got, I've got some questions about that because, like, I mean, there's very few shows I've seen where the star of the show walks off stage and says, I'm going for a wee. <laughs> uh, it's very entertaining, especially when it's an interview with two people and there's only one person on the stage. So, uh, yeah, I, I do my best. So, did you at least take a radio mic in there so people knew what was going on, like, on the, <laughs> like in the Naked Gun movie? I don't think he took him into the bathroom. I, I think it was turned off when he went off stage, so that was well, all fine. You, you would hope so. And was he an interesting person to walk, work with? Because he tended to shout occasionally, but for <laughs> no reason at all. It was like he was on some kind of spectrum. I think he was just trying or a bell to, curve. Uh, to, to, uh, to get people's attention, and I think that that's his way of, of doing it. But he, he is a genius. Uh, he's a, a stunning person to talk to, and um, yeah, he, he certainly knows his stuff, and he's uh, yeah, he swears a lot as well. So uh, I, I, I think all entertaining too. He developed that yell, yelling, I think, because he's he's done a few nine AM lectures for students. I reckon that's I think exactly just, why. I think he just wakes himself up. He was jet lagged for the whole time when he was in Australia. He was only here for a week, so I think like yelling quickly um, <laughs> was actually his way of uh, opening up his own eyes rather than anybody else's. Look, look, but you just come back from a very interesting. It sounds like a very interesting um, STI clinic in the US. Um, <laughs> you might be referring to Burning Man. And yeah, the <laughs> Burning Man. I thought, that is a great name. I thought, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it it's does what it says on the label. Yeah, yeah, Burning Man, not Burning Urine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't see why anyone would want that as a festival, but still, how did it go? I, b I believe that they have zero carbon imprint, which means that they smoke the entire camp before they leave. <laughs> that might be what, what's going on. Uh, so Burning Man, they had about 70,000 people this year, and it's a big music festival, um, uh, dance festival, uh, all sorts of amazing artwork all, all through the uh, this amazing desert, um, this flat land of Black Rock City, of Black Rock Desert. Um, yeah, like it, it's a very interesting, heavy place to go. And being a sceptic, um, I always have very open eyes whenever I'm walking around. Was there much, much peyote going on there? 
I think there were, I didn't see any peyote, unfortunately, okay. but um, I'm sure some people were having their ritual ceremonies of, of cactus juice around. Oh, that would be the self-proclaimed pharmacists. Oh. And uh, do you think it's, it's, it, this sceptic angle's been introduced to it, like, like Comic-Con, or ha- has it grown up around something like that? I think Burning Man's quite an interesting area because you've got so many people that are very um, woo-esque. Um, they're, they're looking at the, the, the craziness that's around. They're trying to connect with the universe. They're taking drugs to do that sometimes as well. They've got rituals. Uh, they, they, um, they're often taking LSD or mushrooms or cactus juice and, um, and having these amazing experiences in their own brain and, and around this amazing um, desert area. But then you've also got the other side of it where you're, they're driving around art cars, which are like the size of dragons, and, and um, yeah, just amazing uh, buses uh, like made it, made into pirate ships, all sorts of stuff. But these drivers have to be stone cold sober to, to drive them around. Otherwise, it, they're a danger. Um, you've got flamethrowers around. You've got all sorts of like twisting and turning art features everywhere. And so you've got to have a, a fair amount of responsibility, even though everyone's having this amazing party time. Um, there, there's an amazing Tesla um, Tesla coil that um, that uh, sparks off to the tune of Beethoven. <laughs> wow! <laughs> So, yeah, there, there's uh, incredible science right beside um, very, very strange ideas about the universe. Um, one, of, one of my uh, friends who I was camping with is a dancing oracle. So, um, so she, she, being a dancing oracle, she, uh, she gets people to ask her questions about their life or the universe. She's like a human tarot card, and by she looking at her, you can card. say, I'm going to have bone problems when I get older or something like that. Well, you, you ask her a question and then she will just stand in front of you and then she will let the universe talk through her as she dances and then you just watch her dance. Ah, and that's then how they do the drive show. And you will, you yeah. interpret that <laughs> and then you can uh, understand or come to a conclusion about that question that you asked her just from watching her dancing. She has invented something that uh, psychics on, particularly on the one, has, they've completely bypassed actually having to lie. They can just say nothing and stand there. That's exactly. perfect. That's your interpretation. Now, I think there's a market for that. So if anybody wants to, <laughs> to learn that, I will talk to you after. That'll be fine. But yeah, she, she was also um, talking about her, um, her birth as well. And um, she, she was um, she's very disgruntled because apparently she was having a natural delivery. Um, and then she ends up saying that she had an unnecessary cesarean. And from a doctor's point of view, if you're having a natural delivery and then you end up having an emergency cesarean, it's probably necessary. (laughs) Yeah, I think the key word there is emergency. Yeah, yeah. And so um, so we all know that um, that if you have a cesarean section, then the doctor, the obstetrician, cuts you through your ignition. Like a Datsun. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so since she's had a baby four years ago, um, and, she, her, and then her ignition was cut at that time, she's been really sluggish to get up in the morning. <laughs> so, yeah, so she, uh, she wasn't sort of talking about having her child. Yeah, um, and that been, might make her a little bit sluggish in the morning and, and to live yeah, more time. Everyone I've known that's ever had a kid has suddenly got really sleepy for many years afterwards. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Where are the long-term studies? <laughs> well, you need to check their admission. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I'd like to talk about drugs again, because uh, at, 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 at the Burning Man Festival, they're experiencing uh, psychedelics in a more shaman-type, communal way that they were probably well, thought to be intended. It's like the, uh, it's the paleo diet of drugs that they think they're doing, like, the, like they're taking drugs the way they thought they might have been done in... in, 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 in age. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and do you think there's any, anything in that, in that like they can look after each other, people can look at any side effects and intervene or something like that, or do you think it's just hippie poo-poo? Well, I remember hearing a discussion from a scientist who, who took mushrooms at home with her husband standing beside her, and she documented, or well, he documented, everything that she was saying and, and doing. And she, she describes like putting her hand on the kitchen bench at home and seeing all, all of the pattern, all of the woodwork from the kitchen bench, like spreading up her arm and into like, onto her body, and how she was connecting with that. 
So, um, yeah, there, there's this interesting way that you can scientifically look at drug use and, and see how that is uh, connecting your, your brain to the universe or how your brain is altered through that experience. I notice you are trying really carefully not to use the word holistic. Because <laughs> holistic could have actually fitted into that sentence you just said. Uh, Couldn't I have disagree. Okay. That's true. <laughs> and, and in a case when someone disagrees with you and they're from uni, you, they're usually right, I've found. I've, I've lost a lot of money that way in bets over the years. But uh, where can we catch you on your website? Maybe use the word holistic in all sorts of sentences. And are, are you going to go touring out with the Think Kink people again? Because they are party animals. We'll see. Uh, well, I'm still recovering. They play, <laughs> they play Scrabble till yeah. two in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> going going to the nightclub with a Scrabble board is always a bit weird, <laughs> but that's fine. Um, yeah, you can catch me on my Facebook site and on Twitter at Dr. Brad McKine. Cool. And uh, if we want to get some letters into your next TV appearance, where should we send some stuff into you? Because you're always looking for interesting interaction. And often it's like, my dog has a sore claw or something like that. <laughs> I think you're mistaking me for a vet. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm mistaking the Channel 9 morning audience from knowing the difference between a human doctor and a vet. <laughs> Let's make him welcome and say goodbye and buy him a drink, Dr. Brad McKine. Thank you. Which one's yours? Look, there's three microphones. There's three. Okay, I'll try this one. I'll have this one. Anyway. And by the way, I don't know who, if you watch um, Channel 9, Maynard, of course. Last night on the Doctor Doctor program, Maynard was playing the, the, the lawyer, weren't you? I was a lawyer lawyer. He was a lawyer lawyer. <laughs> so um, that's, that's great to see Maynard back on our TV screens. Now... Time to give our way our next prize. Tickets ready. And to do this, Maynard, you're going to have to step back just for a minute before we draw the prize. I'm going to fire them out of a cannon. You're going to fire them. That's right. I'd like to uh, call up to the stage from Think Inc., Susie and Dash. Here they are, everybody. Here they are. They can struggle like no one else. Think Inc. Thank you, everyone. Uh, There was a scenario that we wouldn't have been invited to anything skeptic related because in 2014 we decided to tour James Randi and we were specifically advised don't be the don't be the group that kills James <laughs> and we didn't because he was a machine <laughs> um, yeah absolutely well we have had the pleasure of working with the skeptics for a while you guys for a while we haven't met you before so hello um, pleasure of working with Iran with Richard when we toured James Randi with Brad uh, for Dr Goldacre I believe here quite closely too so what we do at Thinking is we really try and um, raise a discourse around scientific thinking, um, rational thinking, intelligent thought, trying to make it a little bit more cool um, so that the young people can start voting better and uh, be a little bit more informed with their decisions. So that's what we're all about. We do that by bringing really inspirational um, minds to Australia, the biggest thinkers that you can think of. Um, and that's what we do. And so it's been a great few years for us, and next year is going to be great. You want to talk about next year? Very quickly. Um, we haven't really announced. Uh our next year lineup. This year we've uh, so far had five tours. We've got one more coming up with Dr. Lisa Randall, uh, and that's happening in November. Next year we're going to do something very different, and you're the first public group to hear about this. We've got uh, seven tours and um, one. Can't talk about that. I'll be told. No, I can't tell the eight. So we've got eight things. Um, we can definitely say there's seven tours and an eight mystery thing happening. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is, because there's so many events, we're going to be offering a group of people the ability to get an annual pass. So it would be it would be properly cheap. Uh, but you'll get access to some of the world's greatest thinkers. Uh, and some of Australia's greatest thinkers at these events. We'll be covering from everything from social sciences to hard sciences. So, <laughs> but we will not be giving platform to any ideas that doesn't require a platform like yeah. anti vaxxers or things like that. Um, that will not happen at, uh, at Think Inc. Anyway, let's give away this prize. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Think Inc. are graciously going to. <clears throat> Give away a prize, Maynard, will you do it? People, yep. got your tickets ready? It's going to be turned, isn't it? I, I do hope they're bringing out the person who invented two-minute noodles. I'd like to know who that was. A100. Here we go. It's blue ticket again. A, A35. Clickety-click, 35. Yay! 
Do you know what you win? What do I get? Two tickets to Lisa Random. Thank you very much, Thinking, and what a pleasure it was to work with Thinking. Thank you, yes. Uh, when I toured with James Randi, it was quite an experience, it really was, and thank you to Thinking for doing all that. Now, we have only a couple more segments before the end of the show. No time for Ancient Aliens? Ancient, no, there is never time for Ancient I'd Aliens. I'd love to see Eric Von Daniken and the guy with the big hair, that'd be great. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we have one more, uh, before the end of the show, we have one more pre-record from our reporter Shelley Stockham, who can't be here tonight. And this report, again, while the report's on, you may wish to uh, sneak up to the bar and get yourself a drink. It's a short report all about her favourite wacky alternative medicine. So let's see if we can get this rolling. Interesting claims, questioning, take stock with Shelley Stocken. Hi, this is Shelley Stocken. As most of you would know, it's difficult to cover a range of sceptical topics properly without complementary and alternative therapies getting at least a mention. There are just so many different modalities, techniques, pills, poultices, practitioners and panaceas that fall short of what most science-respecting people would call an acceptable standard of evidence. Some, like homeopathy, chiropractic and acupuncture, are so common and familiar, I'm sure I'd only bore you if I brought them up again. But others are so bizarre, so seldom encountered or so stupidly dangerous, they deserve a special mention. So may I present to you, in no particular order, my top five lesser-known strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. First up is an ancient elixir, most commonly found in the loo. If you have an inkling to drink what you're tinkling, then maybe this woo is for you. I'm talking about urine therapy. The practice of consuming your own freshly made urine for good health. Mmm, mmm. I remember my year eight biology teacher telling me if I was ever lost at sea, I'd be better off drinking my own urine than I would drinking seawater. It was the first time I'd ever heard you'd be better off and drinking urine in the same sentence. But people who dig urine therapy don't save wee guzzling for emergencies. They recommend drinking it every day to stave off a huge range of health issues from wrinkles and excess mucus to asthma and multiple sclerosis. It's often claimed that urine is a rich source of nutrients specifically tailored to your own body. When you consider the evidence, or lack of it, for the health benefits of urine therapy, most of the proponents' claims can be flushed down the toilet. I mean, sure, urine contains tiny amounts of beneficial substances, but you can get higher concentrations of those nutrients in tasty food and drink that hasn't already been through your digestive system. On the plus side, Whittle is very cheap and easy to make, but drinking it is kind of gross and basically useless. That's why it makes it into my top five lesser-known, strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. Now, if health problems plague your existence because your bones aren't in their proper place, a balloon up your nose can relieve all your woes by increasing the space in your face. I'm talking about neurocranial restructuring, otherwise known as bilateral nasal-specific technique, functional cranial release, and two or three other sciencey-sounding names. This technique is usually performed by a chiropractor or naturopath and involves a small lubricated balloon attached to an air pump. The balloon is manoeuvred up a nostril and into a sinus cavity, then inflated for a short time. The procedure is repeated several times during a treatment session. Neurocranial restructuring is believed to be able to move the sphenoid bone in the skull, which, in turn, is supposed to relieve tension and adjust misalignment of other bones in the body, thus creating optimum conditions for health. One practitioner's website lists no fewer than 59 conditions that can be helped by poking a balloon up your nose, 
ridiculously including Down syndrome, autism and motor neuron disease. Whether or not the bones in your face are actually shifted by this technique, or whether it can relieve anything except a heavy wallet, has not been proven by science. Really unlucky patients might get a bonus nosebleed or facial fracture with their therapy, which is why neurocranial restructuring slides easily into my top five lesser-known strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. Next up, the secret to curing all cancer, when done in the Max Gerson way, is lots of fresh juices and bottom hole sluices with cold coffee five times a day. If you haven't heard of Max Gerson, you may have heard of Jessica Ainscoe. The former is the creator of Gerson therapy for treating various cancers and other ailments, and the latter was his most well-known Australian disciple, the so-called wellness warrior who died of epithelioid sarcoma at age 30 in 2015. Managed and marketed by the Gerson Institute in California, Gerson therapy consists of three main parts. First, diet which involves preparing and consuming about 13 freshly squeezed juices and three vegetarian meals every day. Next is nutritional supplements such as potassium, Lugol's solution, vitamin B12, thyroid hormone and pancreatic enzymes. And the third part is detoxification, which is the administration of coffee enemas up to five times a day, presumably if you can find the time between juicing things. All this is supposed to flood the body with nutrients and rid the entire system of diseased tissue, making it practically impossible for cancer to thrive. The minimum suggested treatment period for cancer is two years. The evidence supporting the effectiveness of Gerson therapy is not at all strong, and it appears the Gerson Institute doesn't routinely follow up its patients' progress. That, combined with the fact that patients are discouraged from using conventional cancer treatments while undertaking Gerson therapy, earns it a place in my top five lesser-known strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. Now, black salve is the ointment of preference for abscesses, cancers and moles, if you have no issue replacing good tissue with permanent scarring and holes. Black salve otherwise known as red salve, cancema, and bloodroot, is a topical ointment that kills tissue. Applying this corrosive stuff to your skin will painfully destroy it, and possibly a good deal of the meaty stuff underneath too. Why would anyone want to put this horrible stuff on their body? Marketers of black salve will tell you it's a great treatment for skin cancer, and that it will only attack cancerous cells. That is, to put it nicely, complete rubbish. Although some human and animal studies have found that sanguinarine, one of the ingredients in black salve, selectively kills some cancer cells in vitro, there is no evidence that black salve, used as recommended by its promoters, safely or effectively targets only cancerous tissue. Black salve doesn't stop to think about which cells are sick and which cells are healthy. It just kills cells. If you have a strong stomach and don't mind looking at large, scabby flesh holes, search online for images of what black salve can do. The incredible thing is how easy it is to find stories and pictures of horrible injuries and deformities caused by black salve. Yet some people still say, yep, that looks good, I'll give that a crack. So black salve burns its way into my top five lesser-known, strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. Lastly... We're all searching for that miracle solution. We all want what thorough wellness can provide. If you're keen to drink some bleach, health is well within your reach once the vomiting and stomach cramps subside. (laughs) Self-proclaimed healer and Archbishop of the Genesis II Church of Health and Healing, Jim Humble, developed the Miracle Mineral Solution, also known as Miracle Mineral Supplement, in 1996. He claims it can effectively treat malaria, cancer, HIV, autism and a huge range of other conditions by eliminating pathogens and supercharging the immune system. The tonic is basically sodium chloride and water, which is activated by adding citric acid in lemon juice or lime juice, for example, then consumed a few drops at a time several times a day. The miracle part of Miracle Mineral Supplement is that it hasn't killed more people. It is, effectively, bleach. 
There's no reliable evidence that it can effectively treat anything, but many examples of vomiting, diarrhoea, hospitalisation and death resulting from its use. The Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration, the US Food and Drug Administration, Health Canada, New Zealand's MedSafe and many other health authorities have issued warnings against this product, which is just one of the reasons it qualifies for my top five lesser-known strange or dangerous complementary and alternative therapies. Maybe you have your own top five and your own special favourites. But thanks for listening to mine. All right, now before the next segment of the show, we've had the strange situation where both microphones, the batteries have just given out. Ah. <laughs> just before the finale of the show. But why we're, actually, why we're, um, why we're sorting out our battery issues, we'll carry on anyway. Nearly there. Uh, one more prize giveaway from our friends at Allen and Unwin. We have a wonderful book by uh, Ian Graham to give away. It's fascinating. Pinball science. It's all about uh, energy and conservation of energy and how things work, motion. It's, it's extraordinary. Yep. And you get to build your own pinball machine. It's a book and a pinball machine. It's a book and a pinball machine. Wow. So tickets at the ready, everybody. All right, let's check this one. It is a blue ticket. And it's A09. A9. Over here we have a winner. Yes. Congratulations, sir. You've got a book that turns into a pinball machine. Okay, folks, we're just about to wrap up the show, but we'll just put this away. And has this show been marred by controversy or not? (laughs) There was the hair incident. Um, the guy who wasn't here, oh, the list just goes on. It was, it was more marred by technical ineptitude, but we, but we got through it. A few technical issues. Like, this is playing the theme music for no reason, I don't know why. <laughs> and for those audio files in the room, I always thought that the theme to the Skeptic Zone has too many high-end transients. There. Now, for the people who knew what that is, they thought that was really hilarious. It was intentional, my now, because it's aimed at an older audience. Ah, who can't? All right. Because we've got tinnitus. That's right. Well, you may have to say, give me the mic at work. It's boosting the high range. It's going up your ear. There we go. It's in my ear. Ladies and gentlemen, to round off the Skeptic Zone, the co host of the Skeptic Zone in his guise as Dr. Seven, it's Dr. Seven Slicker! Yeah! Hi, I'm Dr. Stefan Soika of the Transcendental Healing Clinic for Online Spiritual Fulfillment and Wellness. For 20 years now, the internet has been little more than a cesspool of dark energy, negative karmic vibes and misdirected transmundanities emanating explosively from humanity's collective base chakra. Billions of souls plugged into the great digital energy field have been effectively banging their godhead against an astral brick wall. Why? Because the internet's true cosmic power has until now remained untapped and unrecognised. Rather than fulfil our quest for internal enlightenment, it has done little else but amplify the human species' cellular memory and past life karmic inheritance into a cacophony of biorhythmic arm wellness that no amount of global homeopathic treatment or mass acupuncture program could ever hope to repair. That is why I have developed the ultimate solution to a rapidly uncoiling digital kundalini with the Transcendental Healing Clinic for Online Spiritual Fulfillment and Wellness New Age Internet Filter. Yay! We've all wanted one. A, a New Age Internet Filter, people. All right. At last, for the low, low price of $8,888.88, you will be given absolute protection from the risks of allowing spiritual entities from the lower realms to puncture your aura and invade your meridians, causing a whole litany of ailments from sluggishness and listlessness to liver toxification and autism. So how does it actually work? May well you wonder. Without giving too much away and jeopardising my global distribution deal through the fabulous and esteemed Say No to Vaccination Business Referral Network, (laughs) what I can tell you is that it's all about quantum. Quantum, quantum, quantum. Quantum, quantum, quantum. quantum. It's all about quantum. (laughs) 
After an intense four-day meditation and ethnobotanical retreat on the outskirts of Nimbin, I discovered that every online signal is accompanied by a crystalline quantum carrier signal that until now no one has been able to detect, let alone filter out. The extremely subtle vibrations which manifest only within dark matter and the ethereal cosmic plane require not just incredible genius to understand, as I do, but the phenomenal engineering pseudoscience to track and ultimately filter. After a further four days of magic mushroom boot camp, I cracked the quantum code of the internet and devised the technique I present to you today. Behold! The Transcendental Healing Clinic for Online Spiritual Fulfillment and Wellness New Age Internet Filter. (laughs) Now, now, it looks deceptively simple, doesn't it? Well, like anything quantum, it is. And it isn't. For the listeners... The filter looks like an ectoplasm-infused and hyper-tuned hydrocarbon compound thin-film quantum wave particle duality filter secured to an ingenious mechanical device to a twin silicon-based translucent computer screen refracting anatomically structured lenses surrounded by a hardened hydrocarbon scaffolding brilliantly designed to leverage the fulcrum of the human ear to maintain stability and ensure that quantum filtering function is at least as continuous as the most stable internet connection. But for those present in the room tonight, the filter looks like a piece of cellophane picked or a pair of glasses. The metaphysical scientific application of the latest quantum insights, you will note, causes the previously clear cellophane to transmogrify into a hue that one would say almost closely resembles the colour of a popular and beautiful garden flower, the one with thorns on it. With the New Age Internet filter on, every experience is a good one. You will feel enlightened, intelligent and less obese. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. No matter what you do and where you go online, you are ascending the astral planes towards self actualization. Trolling, mansplaining, victim blaming, revenge porn, slut shaming, culturally misappropriating, taking offense and or giving offense, it's all good. With these on. Get clean, stay safe, and become the you you always wanted to be. If only your Instagram account could be could get its follower numbers into double digits. But the best of all, the more Donald Trump you watch, the smarter you get. <laughs> Revolutionise your online experience with a transcendental healing clinic for online spiritual fulfilment and wellness. New Age Internet Filter. Order now. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Well, yes. Whoa. <laughs> you weren't kidding when you said I'm going to have to edit that later on. I told you. I think you have just witnessed the birth of a new style of comedy called Schrodinger's Comedy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, come back up, Stephen. Take the, your... Take your internet filter oh, off. Yeah, Put these back on. Oh, reality. Oh, thank goodness. We've only got one microphone. Oh. The other one's... Look, I'd like to thank you, <laughs> Stephen, for... <laughs> coming along here tonight to be part of the Skeptic Zone Live. Like I said, Stefan and I started this show way back in 2008. Anyway, a big hand for Stefan for coming on oh. tonight. Hey. And thank you, everybody here, for coming along to be part of the Skeptic Zone Live. This show you're listening to will go out this Sunday night after I do all the editing, which will take me a long time, I think. Uh, now, if you're not a subscriber to the Skeptic Magazine, we've got some... Uh, issues to give away. Come up and have a chat. Oh, to we've us. got issues, all right. We've got issues. We certainly do. Don't forget to check out Maynard.com.au for Maynard's podcasts and other lunacy. Thank you, Maynard, for being here tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's, good all it's, it's great to hang out with this shadowy elite. Uh, well, that's the it. That's us. And uh, for everybody else, thank you for coming along and helping us break in the new pub for skeptics in the pub. And until next time, this has been your skeptics guide to the. No, this has been. <laughs> the skeptics on. Thanks and good night. <laughs> I'm glad some people got that joke. <laughs>
That's it. Go to the bar quickly. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisations.